MFs, welcome back. Hustle like you broke. Coming to you on, it will be Tuesday, September 22, that we air exactly six weeks to the day from the most important election of our lifetime. World is still in a crazy place. People probably don't even know, probably won't even hear that the president was accused of sexual assault again. As if this shit even registers anymore. We're up to what, like 18, 20, 30 cases. Shit just gets swept under the rug. No big deal. Who gives a fuck? We got wildfire sweeping across the Northwest and the West Coast. We got hurricanes in the South. Dallas, how's the weather down in Miami today? It is beautiful. It is amazing. And um, it's like one of those perfect September days. I'm very lucky down here. You know, maybe so warm this, for some people, but I like it. <laughs> but this, this uh, latest hurricane then went around Miami? We got a bunch of rain a bunch of water. We had a lot of flooding issues um, and some wind. But yeah, we were lucky otherwise. We were spared, thankfully. Because, you know, there's nothing worse than being in coronation and then also having your house smashed. Hmm. Fucking Florida, where she can call it beautiful on the one hand and then say we had wind, rain, flooding, and a bunch of other shit. But it's beautiful right now and life is good. Like, I don't even fucking get it. (laughs) And my beautiful pool is finally open again. The most incredible pool in the National Historic Registry in Coral Gables is back open. So I'm a much happier person. So because at least I could swim. Thank you. Well, to our listeners out there today, speaking of Dallas and swimming, we're trying something new. We're actually looking at each other. And I mean, I'm, I suppose I'm still thankful people aren't actually looking at me. But uh Dallas registers as the Venetian Aquatic Club on her (laughs) Google account. So I am really fucking impressed by that. As I said pre-recording, I feel like going forward, I will tell everyone anytime that Dallas is on the road with us that we are touring with the fucking Venetian Aquatic Club. (laughs) This woman is a baller for anybody that has any doubts in the world. This woman is a fucking baller. (laughs) Kyle Hamilton, you knew that, didn't you? Almost definitely. That's how she rolls. Exactly. (laughs) So you're out in uh, beautiful, sunny, hazy California. How shit where you are today? Smoky Fonia is official right now. (laughs) It's uh, smoky. It's uh, cold. How do you have clouds, but it's smoke, and it's low laying like fog, like low haze? I mean... But it's is it smoke? Up. Is it cloud? Is it haze? Which it's is it? everything. It's all the above. It's smoke. There's more smoke than haze. Um, in the morning, it's like low fog, but it's fog with smoke. It's crazy. It, it, it's, it's fucked up out here. <laughs> I mean, I, I'll be honest. I was, I, I was never so happy to be leaving sunny Southern California as I was when I flew home a few days ago. I will say, however, it was really nice to catch up in person with my brother Banks, who is with us again today. Oh, that looked like that that seemed like that seemed like a shot. What's going on? Oh, yeah, I think it is a shot. I think it is a shot. He he scud missled me. He scud missled me. (laughs) I I mean, I I was I didn't say that you blew me off twice. I didn't say that twice. But apparently, you had to bring that to to the table. the subtext speaks volumes. You know, California's on fire. We hot. Lakers are hot. Oh, <laughs> balance. <laughs> but um, at the end of the day, I mean, we were doing a video shoot. I called you while we were in. I FaceTimed you while we were in rehearsal. So, you know, you that's did. what it was. You did FaceTime me three on three different occasions, which oh. I will appreciate. Mm-hmm. I, I do have to say, and now I'm really calling you out, two of those three times, you were indoors and not wearing a mask. <laughs> but I was six feet. Oh, God. I was six feet apart. I'm just saying, indoors, wear and a I fucking my, mask. And I had my own personal uh, filtration system very nearby. 
So what was, the fuck is your own personal filtration system? What is that? They, they, you gave, they, they literally gave me a little filtration thing that cleared the air in a 30 feet radius. Shit. What? Wow. Oh, I know what you're talking about. You're talking about, again, the uh, WIH with their, those little white filtration. No, it was about the size of a, a small air conditioner, portable air conditioner. Yeah, they're like oh. 12, 14 feet, inches wide. They're like six inches tall. They're blowing the air through. Nah, it we had a couple like a, of those it in the like studio. A big, it looked like a big ass baby portable air conditioner. It was yeah, massive. That's, that's that one that they use when they're filtering out the air in the rehearsal rooms. That big ass yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what about. Yeah. But I had, they, everybody had their own little zones and I had mine. So I was Gucci. Yeah. Mm, no, so that's this, that's, why, that's why I said this particular run was not playing you know my nose got fondled multiple times wait what, um, <laughs> what? <laughs> my nose was fondled i just got fondled my nose got fondled again yesterday you know you're talking so, about the brain scrape yeah they, they scratch your frontal lobe and you know it shit ain't sweet but i've won an oscar every time i had a test because that one tear comes down <laughs> I mean, you're a better man than me because I cry like a fucking baby when I get that shit. There is no doubt. For like five minutes there, I am just like waterworks. I can't control mm-hmm. myself. The first first nostril goes in. I'm like, oh, shit, that hurts. And then the second one, and it's over. At that it's point, real. I'm just rolling around on the floor crying like a fucking baby. Uh, it's it's uncontrollable. It's, it's for real. How yeah, it's quick were the results? 15 minutes. Yeah. Oh, so they oh. were. They were like the real instant testing. Was they were doing it on site. Nice. Yeah. And then, the, and then the other ones that we got, we they were like two hour results. That's still PCR. yeah. We still we were doing the sixty minute, but uh, fifteen minutes. How? What kind of accuracy can you get on a fifteen? minute Well, because she test? went deep. She touched your brain, so she was like, <laughs> the deeper you go, the better it is. And I was like, God damn. I mean, wow. it made your you made your eyes cross. It was it was weird. That was the <laughs> deepest one ever. I'm like, yo, that's it, that's disrespectful. It, it made your eyes cross. <laughs> yeah, it was weird. And then when she yeah. went in there, she kept stirring like she's stirring coffee. <laughs> I'm like, duh. <laughs> and she literally counted ten seconds per strill. And per strill. <laughs> she just kept going. I'm like, yo, this is ridiculous. She said, that's one you did very well. I'm like. Yeah, <laughs> that's terrible. Yeah, it, it, it's disrespectful. It's like the way she went into your nostril, like when you were playing um, the game Operator or whatever, when you didn't <laughs> can touch the sides. Operation. And you felt, yeah. Operation, you felt it, but she was, you felt her fucking with your nose hair, and then she gets up in there, and she just spinning, and she spins for 10 seconds. She counted out. One, two, three. <laughs> well, I'm like, God damn. And she went away. She said, I said, well, do you call us to let us know? And she said, well, the way we do it here, if we don't call you, you're good. If we call you, there's a problem. Yeah. I said, so no news is good news? She said, exactly. She said, because if, if, if anybody tests positive, we, we got to shut the whole place down because it's, it's contaminated at that point. So it was rough. I think MF looked this woman in the eye and said, next time you touch me like that, you best be buying me dinner first. <laughs> if a woman bought me dinner, that'd be weird. <laughs> what, gentlemen? Unless we've been dating for a minute, I don't want nobody buying me dinner. That's that's reverse. That's back. That's like a woman saying, "Will you marry me?" It's fucked Come up. Come on, are this you getting new, sexist this, on us now? But this this new world. No, there's certain things a motherfucker has to put his foot down. Yes, <laughs> will you be my wife? Not will you marry? Will you be my husband? That's that's backwards. That's fuck that. If a woman ever Dallas, asks me to marry her, I'm breaking shit. up with her instantly. Come on, Dallas, jump in on that. I'm kind of old-fashioned that way. I feel you. I think, I mean, I don't want to take anything away from anybody, but I'm more of the... uh, I'm taking it away from her. I'm fine with a man buying me dinner. I'm absolutely fine with a man buying me dinner. No, I'm not saying my girl... I'm not saying my girl can't buy me dinner, my wife can't buy me, but like just a girl, I'm going to take you to dinner. No, that's weird. That's kind of... It's like... It's backwards. It's the reverse. Men are supposed to, you know do the pursuit and then lock it in. And then once you got locked in, then she can purchase you uh, some vittles or whatnot. But prior to, nah, that's right. That's why. 
this kind of sounds like the whole we've been doing it the same way for all these years. Why would we change it? Type logic, which certain is things, exactly counterintuitive certain, to the way this concert industry need to, needs to come things, out of the coronation. Certain things need to stay status quo. A man is supposed to be a man and do what he's supposed to do. Period. <sighs> okay, okay. I'm gonna leave that one alone. I, I, me, I'm an equal rights advocate. And I think that's a bunch of bullshit. I'm just going to put it out there. I think it's a bunch of bullshit. You're entitled to your own opinion. <laughs> Moving on. But the facts Kyle are, wanted to talk the about his Lakers. <laughs> exactly. I wanted to the talk Lakers about his Lakers. But, but, but I do want to ask you two things. First of all, first of all, <laughs> do you feel like their path to the finals has somehow been made easier by the Clippers being eliminated? And don't you think that's, you know, going to kind of diminish your, 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 your title if such a thing is attainable in the future for you? First of all, I couldn't wait for the Clippers to beat Denver so we could whoop the Clippers' ass so they could quit talking. All The Clippers have not, not one banner ever. So I want to put the end to this conversation of Clipper Nation is, is, is running L.A. <laughs> Clipper Nation ain't running shit because they've never got out of the second round. They've never even been to the Western Conference Finals ever. Wow. Secondly, they had three times to win one time. They were up 3-1. <laughs> and to give the give it up like that shows you a bunch of bitches. Oh. Period. <laughs> Bitches. Oh, yeah. Bunch of bitches <laughs> because you guys are all running around here. I didn't even know Kawhi Leonard was a clipper. He played so off and on. He was always on rest. All that rest got that ass set down. Well, okay, okay. Well, I, I hear the shots fired there. Let, let me give this right back to you. So you busted my balls earlier in this mm-hmm. podcast season a couple weeks ago when I made a comment about whether or not Dwight Howard was playing and you told me that I obviously wasn't paying attention, that he's a beast, that he's been going off, yada, yada. I got to tell you something in the series that they just came off with Houston. I could have watched all five of those games and not noticed that he was a member of the LA Lakers for, for a couple of reasons. First of all, he did play 11 minutes in the first game. He did not play in the second game. He did not play in the third game. He did not play in the fourth game. Mm-hmm. And he played less than five minutes Here's in the, the fifth game. Between. In Here's that time, difference. hold on, hold on. Uh-huh. Your beast, your beast scored exactly zero field goals. Zero mm-hmm. in that five-game series. He had four points off of free throws total between those games. He had, I think, six, four, five or six boards total across those games. And he registered a goose egg in most other statistical categories. So, I mean, tell us about this beast of yours and his massive contributions to the Lakers' success. The difference is between, if you want to make comparison between Kawhi and Dwight Howard, Kawhi is a starter. Dwight Howard is a role player. If his number gets called to play, he comes to do what he's supposed to do. He may may not even be there to make points. He's there to be a rim protector. That's his role play. Kawhi is the Clippers. He was drafted hard to be that cat. And he goose egg. He failed. And he didn't, if he broke it out to the whole season, maybe he played half the season because the other half he sat out for rest. What are you resting for? Just go home? That's exactly what they did. They rested to go home. <laughs> okay. Well... We're going to see what comes. By the time we air, we'll be a couple games into the Lakers. Matter of fact, you guys uh, play tonight, West I believe. Conference Finals from? Hmm? I, believe you, I believe you guys play tonight. Celtics play game two tonight. That to is the true. Heat. You, to the Heat. Will, will, yep. you, will you get your dunk blocked again for a uh, beat down 0 2? Man, man, it, that was a tough one. That was tough to watch. No, nah, that mean, wasn't tough. That Tatum was Tatum looked good. If you go up hard to the paint, and you're going to dunk on another grown-ass man. You don't go up with a one-hand dunk. You go up with two hands, and you dunk with authority. He went up soft. He got his dunk blocked, and that dunk would have won the game. But now you're I mean, one. I mean, you have to leave I, it I'm on not the on floor. the Celtics. You have to leave it on I the don't floor. Go, you are a Celtic. I don't plow. You are the epitome I, I, of Celtic. 
Pride. That's right. Well, you're right. You're right. Actually, people don't know it, but I am actually Jason Tatum in disguise. This is true. (laughs) And so everything Kyle's talking about, I am feeling very hurt and upset by by his commentary about me because apparently, which which member of the Lakers are you? Remind us which member of the Lakers are you? I am. I am on the floor looking at them talking about go Lakers. I'm not on a team. I'm simply courtside. Got it. Cheerleader. Copy. Okay. Hey, I'll be Moving that. on. I'll be that. I know my place. Moving my place on. is mixing. Moving on. So I will say, before we stop talking about basketball, actually, for, forget rivalries, forget teams. I just want to point out, we had an episode, our most recent recording with Chris Gratton, where he did point out, as we have talked about many times before, the fact that the NBA continues to lead all of American culture, all of popular culture, certainly, you know, point, pointing the way for, for all athletes, for artists, for venues on how to behave, on how to reopen, on how to, you know, look at the future and reconsider the possibilities, the opportunities, and, and the path forward. Uh, so I continue to give the NBA credit for that. On the other hand... I want to give the NFL some credit for their moment of solidarity that they had at the beginning of the uh, opening Chiefs game. (laughs) But, (laughs) but to listen to the fucking limited number of fans in the seats who paid tickets to watch a predominantly black group of players on the field and to hear them boo during the moment of silence in what was supposed to be a show of unity is a fucking disgrace, a fucking disgrace. It is exactly what is wrong with this fucking country where people think they're so fucking entitled that they can just boo. And in a situation where we are supposed to be talking about unity and respect and appreciation and to me, what was meant to be a show of country and you hear these fucking fascist Trumpers booing, I defy anybody to tell me otherwise. Banks, what do you think of that? It was fucked up. It was really fucked up. And then just hearing the spin, you know, coming from all different sides saying, you know, oh, we were booing because they were in the locker room beforehand. And, oh, no, politics have, you know, no uh, no place in sports. I thought it was just bullshit. You know, people complain about you kneeling. People complain about you saying the locker room. But the minute you come onto the field, show solidarity, then there's still a problem. It's really fucked up. Really fucked exactly. up. Exactly. And that brings us back to the state of the world and the state of the country. Here we are sitting at home during this coronation, trying to pick up a gig here, a gig there, doing what we can, just waiting for this fucking election six weeks from now, hoping and praying people do what obviously we here consider the right thing. But more and more, I'm hearing about the Trumpers that are just coming out of the woodwork. They are you know, all in on their guy. I'm not hearing the same for Biden. I still continue to hear that, uh, you know, the best reason for Biden to be elected is that he's simply the alternative to Trump. And, you know, we see this town hall just last week and Trump can't answer a straight fucking question. But people are talking about all these independent voters. And I'm wondering who these fucking independent voters are that are still actually undecided in this election. Like who the fuck is undecided in this election? And I'm reminded of this quote, this, the, the, the writer journalist, David Sedaris, and this has become a popular meme lately, but I just think it's fucking funny as shit. And I think it's right on point. He says, To put these undecided voters in perspective, I think of being on an airplane. The flight attendant comes down the aisle with his food cart and eventually parks it behind my seat. 
says, can I interest you in the chicken or would you prefer the platter of shit with bits of broken glass on it? (laughs) And to be undecided in this election is to pause for a moment and ask, how is the chicken cooked? (laughs) Like, how the fuck is it possible that anybody is on the fence in this election right now? How the fuck? Dallas, tell me. How the fuck is on anybody on the fence in this election right now? You know, first I'm female, so I have no idea. I, it is absurd to me that anyone can ever consider him for anything aside from, well, I'm not going to say what I think he's worth. But um, <laughs> I just think it's diabolical and it's so hard to talk to people that you know. If they, you know, I have neighbors that are obviously fans. They've got the sign outside and it takes every part of me not to rip the sign up. But, you know, I realize I have a right to speak. I think we all do. We, as Americans, we have the opportunity to get out and vote. And I think, you know, you have to vote your conscience. And whether, um, and for those of us who care about the future and we believe in science, it's, there's no question. And if you care at all about your fellow man or woman or animal or anything, you just, there's, there's really no question. Because ba- Biden could f- completely be a disaster but i guarantee you he could not be a big as a disaster as this current administration i mean just think about it like for one thing they'll actually put people in office that don't that don't have the same family name that might actually have some credibility or some knowledge of that position you know just that in and of itself excites me um you know the list goes on but you know because i think you know we may have listeners that don't agree with us that may feel you know, there are Republicans and there's nothing wrong with being a Republican, but there's something wrong with Trump. I mean, that's what the story is. At the end of the day, anyone who can incite the violence that he, this man has incited and the hate and the just lack of understanding of empathy and sympathy and recognizing the diabolicalness of his own everything being is just, I don't know, I want him gone. And I want him gone fast. But I realize there are people that believe differently. Um I don't know, and I don't understand why they don't understand science, but um, they have to find it in their souls to recognize that he is not the man to vote for. You know, that's what we need. We need everybody to show up and everybody to vote the right way. You know, which it's not about win. It's about winning for us as America. You know, it's like Beyonce said it best, right? You know, we our lives depend on it. It. There's, there's, you know, it's war. It literally is. I don't know what we'll do if we have another four years of this man. And that's- well, I know a lot of us are going to do is get out of the fucking country. Yep. I think there will be a mass fucking exodus. And I, I think that we, I heard somebody telling me just uh, yesterday that they feel like we could sit or li- literally be watching the first shots in the next civil war in this country it's right now. Mm-hmm. It is terrifying. It, and, and it's real. I, I don't, the problem isn't just Trump. The problem is the people that are complicit, right? Yes. And it's not just Mitch McConnell. And it's not just, I mean, he's fucking evil. And it's not just the Attorney General Barr who acts like Trump's personal fucking henchman. Those people are huge fucking problems. But it's everybody else that goes along with this shit. It's all of the Republicans that have fallen in lockstep that, go along with this shit and that continue to look the other way and pretend all this is not fucking crazy because this shit is fucking crazy. And the more people fall in lockstep with this fucking alt-right fascist dictator wannabe that we've got in office, the wider the division becomes between the fascist party and the democratic party and to anyone, I what I don't understand, and I keep saying this, is I don't understand how anyone that lives in the heartland of America and relies on social programs in order to thrive could vote Republican time after time. Because the Democratic Party is the party of the American people. And the Republican Party is the party of the, what, the, the 1%, the billionaires? And everyone else that votes for them is being duped. They're being fucking conned. And how they can look at the Democrats and call them the liberal, social, educated elite 
and look at the Republicans, like it's it's not even like under George W. Bush where they created this culture that the Republican Party was the one which was filled with the people you wanted to have at the dinner table, the people you wanted to have a beer with. Like, Trump doesn't want to have fucking beer with you. He fucking hates you. He thinks you're a fucking low-life scum. He actually, I honestly believe he actually hates the Republicans even more than he hates the Democrats. Because as much shit as he talks about the Democrats, he knows that he is conning all of the Republicans out there. And he relishes in the fact that he's got those fucking idiots in the palm of his hands. And that's what he thinks of you. He actually hates the Democrats because he knows they are smarter than going along with his bullshit because he really fucking hates the Republicans that vote for him because he knows how fucking dumb you are. Maybe I should move off of that for a moment. Uh, I, I agree. I, I think I think one of the, the biggest issues in the beginning when I was looking at it was like, how can you say America first? And you're golfing and spending taxpayers' dollars at your own businesses. If it's America first, why not put that money into somebody else's pockets? You're literally taking Secret Service, uh, caterers, uh, doctors, all kinds of people, and these people are spending money in your resorts, food, boarding, transportation, all this stuff in your establishments. How is that not an issue? It's all an issue. It's all an issue. But the good news, bringing this back home, bringing it back to the NBA leading the way as a segue to the concert industry, is we've got all these NBA arenas that are planning on opening themselves up and becoming voting, polling locations in this election. And now Live Nation is saying they're planning on opening as many venues as they can. They're otherwise empty, vacant, doing nothing. So let's open some of them up, turn them into polling locations, try and get as many people out to vote as possible. Hopefully, hopefully figuring out ways to get more of the underprivileged communities in places like Georgia and Wisconsin, where... The Republican stifles the Democratic vote by going into certain communities and making it so you have to wait 6, 8, 10, 12 hours to cast a ballot, as opposed to the right-leaning communities where you can literally walk right in, walk right up to the polling station, cast your vote, and go home. They know that there are people who can't wait that long. They know there are people who have hourly jobs where they lose money and they potentially risk losing their employment by waiting in that line, 10, 12, 14 fucking hours to vote. And yet there are people who will do that. They will take that risk because they know the importance of this vote. But if we can do anything to alleviate that, I appreciate the NBA I appreciate Live Nation opening up their venues and creating those polling places. I can only hope that Trump will not figure out a way to stifle those votes. I am sure he's already trying to figure out his response to why those votes shouldn't count. Make no mistake, the Republicans will not win. Trump will not win re-election fairly. He cannot win win re-election fairly. This. And that's why he will do everything to lie, cheat, and steal and fuck it up. Hillary Clinton is actually the only person who has it right. When she came out the other day and said to Biden, whatever happens, do not concede. Whatever happens, do not concede. Because you know damn well if Biden wins, even if he wins in a a fucking landslide, Trump will not concede. And this shit's going to get ugly. It's going to get ugly. But bringing this back home, Kara Hustle Like You Broke, we've had some good episodes lately. And it's been six weeks and 12 episodes since our last Core 4 only. Like my friend Brokaw suggested a while back, we do a 
Dirty Dozen recap. So here we are, 12 episodes later. We've had Huggy Carter, which was great. We've had Chris Gratton, who, who I enjoyed very much. We had Ricky Minor. We did our special edition on roadie solidarity and the importance of voting. We talk about it every week, but we had a good, constructive conversation with Bobby Schneider about ways to use your voice. His uh, vote for Biden, roadies for Biden, campaigns that he's working on. We had Bill Reeves and Lance Casey Jackson from roadies of color just a couple weeks ago. We've had Terry Lynn, Eddie Sato. That was a lot of fun. Danny Trebner, my favorite new travel agent. No disrespect to my old cat travel agents. I've, I've enjoyed all of you, but we had a great interview with Danny. We had a great interview with Mitch Bornstein from, from Hollywood Park, where the LA Rams are playing. And uh, your Rams won too, actually, Kyle, but you're not a Rams guy, right? I'm not a Rams guy. You are fan. a Raiders guy. Raiders. I don't even know how the Raiders did week one. How'd they do? We won. <laughs> Since you're trying to play That's not a, uh, I'm not trying to play you. I was actually asking just a straight up question, and 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 that was not really the emphatic response. What, yeah, we I won. mean, because everybody's trying to play the Raiders. They won. Okay. Why are they trying to play the Raiders? I I came out early on, and I said Mark Davis was actually the first owner in professional sports to say. We are not, or in professional football, rather, to say we are not going to have fans in our stadium in our inaugural season. I respect him for that. He may look like fucking, you know, a poster child for I don't even know what, like like the next coming of, uh, of, of, of Chucky and, and all of that. Like, he is a funny looking dude. But I respect him for coming out and saying and, put, and, and speaking up about the situation with fans. I mean, I, I get it. I mean, he he did ultimately the right thing, especially since uh, they're just trying to figure it out. But um, you know, they got that beautiful new stadium; it's ready for people. The the Rams, Chargers have a beautiful new stadium. I'm ready to be my first person sitting in my seats. So I don't want nobody else sitting in my seats before me. I paid too much money for them. I did do a walkthrough of SoFi Stadium when I was there in LA a couple weeks ago. And uh, I would have let you sit in my place seat. Is fuck- the place is beautiful. What's that now? I would have let you sit in my seat. Go, just go test you, it out. <laughs> you would have let me sit in your seat. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What but if I, I, saw I just. My, I saw my seats were tarped, so covering tarp. So it means I'm not in the nosebleed section. My seats are kind of posh. <laughs> like the this Venetian guy. Aquatic Club. <laughs> Come on, Dallas, no, jump in on that. I don't even know what to say about that. You gotta keep it sexy. You, know? <laughs> you work too hard to be, you know, we work too hard to not be sexy. You gotta keep it sexy. That's right. Yeah, well, there it is. So, yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> But I will say, in, in the absence of a guest today, we actually are going to do something a little bit different. And so you've all heard and we've all talked about tech support. Sam, our own behind the scenes guy who has been with me for a number of years. He's been an integral player in, in bringing this podcast to life. And uh, we, we introduced his voice one episode, however long ago. And he's been bringing together questions about, you know, what's going on with us, thoughts on the episode so far. He's talked to other people. He's gathered questions from them. And uh, so we're actually going to bring out our own tech support, Sam Helm, to the program. And he is going to ask the rest of us, the core four, some questions for today's episode as we move forward. So, Sam... Welcome back to the program. Appreciate you being with us. And, uh, you know, talk to us. What's going on? What's up? Uh, glad to be back. Uh, came up with some questions. Hope you guys enjoy them. 
Uh, I'm just going to jump right in because uh, small talk, not my jam. I haven't like, seen anyone new in like six months. So uh, I feel like we can just be done with all that stuff. Like, just, come on. One thing. Nothing? You got to give us something. Come man. on, like, Sam. That's some like, bullshit. You know all we do is chatter. I mean, we're already fucking 35 <laughs> minutes into this recording. We haven't even started talking about a fucking thing because that's how we roll. So come on, join the party. Like, what the fuck? Uh, I mean, I don't know that there's much that I can add. I feel like we covered politics. I don't watch basketball that often, but I do know that the Celtics got smoked the other night. Not smoked, but they like, did not get smoked. Not a great ending is how I would phrase it. Um, That's and, called a uh, whooping because when you lose by one point on a dunk, softness is in the building. Uh, if they, if they, if they don't make if they don't make it to the finals. He, that that one dunk will haunt him for the rest of his life. Oh, undoubtedly. Undoubtedly. But if we want to go back to Kyle talking about posh real quick, I will offer this up. I've been making stuff with a precision cooker uh, via sous vide, which I'm not going to lie. That shit is off the chain. <laughs> what? The fuck is you talking about? <laughs> what is a, what okay, is a precision so, cooker? A so, precision cooker means you can't fuck it up. It's precisely tasty. A hundred percent. So basically what you do is you vacuum seal like a meat or something and then you put Sounds it in a flavorless. water bath and you lock oh. in the temperature in the water bath with this like pr- with this precision cooker stick. So it can never get hotter than a certain temperature. And then when you're ready to eat it, you take it out, you sear it on the grill or a pan for like 10 seconds. All good. Mastro's does that for their take home kits. Okay. They have it like they, they recommend. Okay. Now I know what you're talking about. It's fantastic. Game changer. You heard what he said, Mastro's. The average person doesn't know what the hell Mastro's is. So the fact that Chris is talking about a high-end steakhouse lets you know how posh he is. <laughs> We're all fucking posh in here. We're all I'm just, posh. I'm just saying, everybody's always jumping on my neck. Ka, 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 ka. We got the Venetian Aquatic Club. We got <laughs> Mr. Precision Cook. And then we have the person who knows precision dining hey there it is and then we got the epitome of living on your own island <laughs> so i mean god island damn living. island, island living. living you know we, we 365 uh, days a year island living uh, he takes a, a ferry to he takes a ferry to his crib i mean that's what it is i mean that's hey we have went full circle per tech support uh, yeah, I is. wasn't actually calling you out on the Kyle on that Kyle. You just said the word posh, and I was like, "Well, if I can contribute something." Well, yeah, you, <laughs> hey, everybody is has it. Basic bitch. Hey, you you in it? Yeah. You got Muhammad Ali on your wall, boxing underwater. Hey, you. I back. love it. I do. I have a signed picture in the other room. <laughs> oh shit! Oh, that's, it. that's See, posh. It, it gets higher. See? Like, keep it going. I wrote him a letter when I was like eleven, and he sent back a, po- a signed postcard. Nice. Wow. There you have yeah. it. That's mm-hmm. dope. That's it was cool. sick. Hey, there it was. Are you ready for questions now? Did I like fulfill your your small talk quota? I don't you, know. You, we might have to keep going on this. We come back to it or something. That we can do cooking class led by Hustle Like You Broke. Yeah, cooking class with Hustle Like You Broke. Okay, okay. That is is that going to be? It. I mean, that's going to have to be a video presentation. That. Oh, 100 percent. I'll even wear my denim apron. <laughs> Okay, forget about it. <laughs> I didn't say I'd be wearing just my denim apron. Oh, it would be more than God. that. <laughs> Sam's, of course, from Maine. So when he says denim apron, he's talking about his everyday overalls, of course. <laughs> it is a fucking fashion crime that is no longer to wear, uh, no longer acceptable to wear overalls after the age of 10 as a man. It's just fucked up. I loved overalls. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to leave that one on. <laughs> That's how my fat ass stayed warm in winter. I mean, that and the extra insulation that I carry, but you know. Uh, Nobody knows that, actually, Sam. Oh, yeah. So in case anybody didn't know this, I'm definitely a fat ass. Uh, Okay, well, there it is. Sam Helm, welcome to the program. For sure. That was a a great introduction. (laughs) We're in there I mean, I'm usually the one who's fucking with people, me or Kyle. I mean, it's not not usual that people just fuck with themselves. That's great. Raiders. 
<laughs> my philosophy with any joke is that as long as nine out of ten people are laughing, it's fine. So sometimes I'm making one person uncomfortable. Sometimes I'm making myself uncomfortable. <laughs> Got to distribute the load. <laughs> <sighs> I want everyone to know right now that Kyle Hamilton does not look impressed at anything that's happening right now. <laughs> I'm just embracing your life. All right. He's like, what the fuck is the matter with this guy? Uh, okay. So first question. Uh, Gratton talked a lot on his episode about the uh, road life balance. And uh, when the four of you are out and about, how do you guys maintain that? Like, what are your strategies to uh, keeping that going? That's a tough one. I, I'll, I'll weigh in on that first and say I struggle with that every time. I struggle with that every time. I uh, try and keep up with my kids. My daughter's great on FaceTime. My son, not so much. He, he resents when I'm gone. I don't know. I, I, <laughs> this is an overshare, but sometimes I feel like my home life is a little more balanced when I'm there. A little less than I am during this whole coronation. Six months at home has definitely been a, an adjustment that's uh, even a bigger adjustment than years on the road. But uh, it's definitely something I struggle with. And um, Kyle, what, what, what do you say to that? For me, it's easy. <clears throat> First, I mean, I talk to my son and my family multiple times a day. So I get the, the I don't necessarily, necessarily do the, you know, take an hour to do X, Y, Z. I just do it at my le- leisure. But on off days, you guys don't see me. I'm in my own world because when you're with your coworker, your tour family for, you know, basically on any given day, say just say 96 hours a week, four days straight, I disappear to give me time to decompress and rebalance myself because, you know, but then you got some people who hang out with everybody on off days, on days, you never get that time to just, be in your own world. So when I'm on an off day, I'm in the room, I'm watching, you know, my whatever shows I may watch just to have a sense of me, but I haven't have anybody in my face. Cause then for the next four days in a row, they're going to be in my face. So I just get away and do me, you know, even if the, even if there's people who I like gravitate to on the tour, you guys don't see me on off days. I'm out. You know, and then I resurface when it's time to come. It's just like basically I'd like me going home after being at work all day and then coming back the next day. Hey, what's up? You've decompressed. So, you know, I, I, I get away from everybody and it's no it's no bitter. Just I got to get away from you. That's that's how I roll. <laughs> Thanks, Dallas. Um, You know, well, Part of the problem I have on off days is I have a lot of work to do. So that's always a challenge, trying to get that work out the way and have an actual day off because it never seems to, you know, and you find yourself sometimes, depending on the nature of the tour, you have to get a little challenged by that because you never actually have any time, absolute downtime because depending on the role you play, you might have to be at the artist's beck and call or someone's beck and call. So that's a challenge. But if I have the opportunity, I'm all about getting some good food and spending a ridiculous amount of money there's excellent service and amazing plates and many of them. And there might be some libations, definitely good vino. And, you know, Venetian. Huh? Huh? <laughs> Venetian. <laughs> and, um, yeah, and I try to get a swim in because if I can find a good pool at the hotel, that's amazing. And sometimes a museum, you know, if we're lucky enough or in a great city, got to get out, got to walk around. That's my zen. Brother Banks, I feel like I try to I try to include my family like all the time when I'm away. Like I try to send videos. I try to show them stuff. Like I'll post on social media. They'll see things you know that I post, and then I'll send my daughter like funny little <laughs> pictures. You know, I try to include them so they feel like they're a part of my road life, so that it's not some separate thing where we're talking about it. Oh yeah. So today I did this, you know, I try to show them what I'm doing every day. And then when we're in town and at home in LA, I try to bring them, you know, to the actual show and let them meet everybody and talk. Okay. This is who I'm talking about. This is who you see in that video. This is when you FaceTime me late at night on one of the bus. This is who I'm talking about. 
you know, so I try to make sure that they're included so they're not just a stranger. When they come in, they feel like they're already a part of it. You know, I talk about my family when I'm on the road so people know exactly who I'm talking about. And then when they see him, it's like, it's a big hug. It's like, oh, yeah, we know you. You know, a lot of people try to keep it separate and that can have issues, <laughs> you know. Uh, it can get you in trouble, <laughs> you know, in some cases, you know, depending on what your situation is. But I always feel like it it's it's it keeps that family vibe on both sides. You know, nobody's worrying like, oh, 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 you know, you know, covering their mouth and trying to, you know, keep it kosher or whatever. It's like, no, nah, this is my family. You guys know how we talk. They know how we talk. I talk like this, you know, and it's always an understanding. Um, and like, you know, like you guys mentioned off days, you know, I, I try to, you know, we grab a good dinner, a good drink, you know, just breaking up the monotony of going to catering and having terrible food and that whole thing. So that's kind of my balance, you know, keeping the family involved with me on my everyday process and showing them stuff and then having that downtime to have a good dinner with my colleagues and, you know, break up the monotony and have a good time. Excellent. On the off day note. Um, and, and like, and in that crew care vein, we talked about, um, or a lot of the feedback that's come from the episodes is about, uh, creating better systems for crew care and then the need to develop, uh, tomorrow's talent. So like, how do you balance that so that you don't wind up with people leaving because they're getting hosed on the road? <laughs> I think that comes with like maturity though, too, as well as like, uh, experience. I think that depending on the tour that you're on, it's going to be a different situation. You know, if you're on a tour that's unorganized and things are happening and you have an inexperienced production manager, TM and a young artist, you know, you may have some issues like that, but I think as a seasoned veteran, even if you're in that situation, you learn to pick out the good and bad help, encourage people, you know, Hey, what's going on? How are you feeling? You know, I see, you, you know, your head's down. What's going on? Hey, let me talk to you for a second. You know, you find as a veteran and a seasoned veteran to kind of pull and find those small things that may have chinks in the armor to try to help, you know, in that situation. But I think it's really just being a person who's aware of your surroundings and being a gracious person. You know, I, I even if I'm having a bad day, I still speak and I still say hey to everybody. I still if I see somebody down, I'm like, hey, what's going on? Hey, what's happening? You know. I still try to encourage, hey, man, I saw what you did. I know it was a tough day. We had a crazy load in. I try to encourage people, you know, because I'm walking in. I'm doing my thing. People are struggling. They're doing all kinds of shit. There's other things happening. So I always try, you know, to be that person that's always positive, you know, regardless of what I'm dealing with, because there's a lot of other people that don't know how to deal with what they're going through, you know. Well, I think, I think communication is part of that, and that speaks to, point, to Banks' point right there. I, I think that the larger, not the larger, but of equal importance is, is leadership. And I think it comes from the top down. I think that the artists that show appreciation to their crews are just that much more appreciated by the people that are working. I think that the production managers, tour managers, tour directors, coordinators that are communicating the daily schedules and what's on the horizon. I think that's absolutely critical, not just because it's important to do things like have team building meetings and exercises and what have you. Although I do think going forward, that becomes, I I think that's something that becomes increasingly important. I think the importance of doing crew meetings, sea party meetings, you know, all company meetings and, and bringing people together more frequently to talk about just big picture what's going on. But it's as simple as just communicating the day to day because, you know, most of the people that are on a tour, they're just, I mean, I hate to say they're along for the ride, but they're there to do their job and they go where they're told they, they land where the bus takes them. They check into the hotel that's been set up for them. They take the flight that's been booked for them. And the biggest complaints that I feel a lot of us here on the road and correct me where I'm wrong. If any of you guys disagree, but I don't think you will. A lot of the complaints we hear is, well, I don't even know where the fuck we are tomorrow. I don't even know what the fuck time, you know, time catering is set up today. People just feeling like, well, they don't even see their day sheets, let alone, you know, being communicated too well. And so I think that that comes and starts with leadership. Because people don't read. You can (laughs) give out a day sheet and give all the motherfucking information right there and they won't read shit. And they're like, well, I didn't know. 
You didn't read. I mean, these are the same people who probably were in elementary school <laughs> that wanted to get a trophy for coming in fifth <laughs> for participation. <laughs> Fuck participation. Get your ass up and be a man or a woman. You don't need somebody to hold your hand for every step of the way. So that's where a lot of this soft shit comes from. It's like, yo, read. All you got to do is read. I mean, it's, 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 it's terrible. You put all the information on a piece of paper. You could text. Motherfuckers won't read a text. All you got to do is do your side. There, there are times where you may have... <clears throat> a lapse in communication for, for, for whatever reason. But more often than not, it's because people don't read shit. And that's what we're I mean, me I, Listen, I'm not going to ne- disagree with that, but I will say that, you know, those couple of people who bring that negativity, you know, that negativity can be infectious and it can have and a negative also effect be fired, on the tour. So you could fire a motherfucker the, for whatever reason. So you can get them out 100% true. But I'm going to put that responsibility on leadership. I'm going to put that responsibility That's on myself. You. You, you, I will. You. I will you put that the, responsibility you on are myself. The hardest person out there. You be like, motherfucker, you soft today? Oh, you got to go <laughs> get out of here. I mean, it's like, yo, I mean, people, here's the thing people want to be like all extra delicate and soft, don't pay shit attention. Let that check be late. <laughs> Why are you worried about the check? Have your ass on point on everything else. Don't just worry about the money. Worry about being on point for you. And if the check is late, then you could cuss somebody out. But you can't be the one who's always missing flights, never on time, always bitching and always moaning, always having issue. If you're the only one always having issues, then the problem is probably you. Keep okay. it all the way okay. live. Pause now. I, I, I appreciate everything you're saying, but Sam's question which I believe is a well-considered question, was more about health and wellness. So I don't think the iron hammer, fuck you, you're fired approach is necessarily the Look, here it best goes response. Back. That's why I said the person who came in fifth wants a fucking trophy. <laughs> you work harder, get your shit together, be on point. Everybody, you cannot have a bad day every motherfucking day. And if that's the case, and it's every time you wake, wake up, there's a cloud over you with rain, then you got to fix yourself. Don't bring that shit over here. That you Then the road's not for you. The road isn't Boom. for everybody. Period. That's a, the road. That's exactly Go ahead, Dallas. No, it's true. I think depending on the, you know, there's a lot of very things that attribute to all this, but depending on the job, depending on the juniorness of the person jumping into the road position, you know, all these things are challenging and depending and you've got to want to be there and i mean like in a lot of times in one of the roles i play you know there are budgetary issues so where i might need you know five assistants to make it a humane situation i'm limited to two and a half other people basically (laughs) and it doesn't work because that means those two or three people you're breaking every day because the amount of volume of stuff they really has to do, they don't get three square meals. You know, it just doesn't allow that actual physical time in the day isn't available. And, you know, and you have to learn how to kind of, it's brutal and, you know, trying to factor in what time of day you can pee. You know, sometimes you got to figure out, like, I can't go to the bathroom right now. You know, you got, you know, and they break. A lot of young people come in today thinking it's a different type of experience. Um, they, they're, it's not like it's a union. You don't constantly, you know, there's not somebody always making sure you're getting three squares and whatever else you may need. Um, and sometimes for some of the younger folks, I think they're not prepared for that experience at all, where once upon a time, that's how you got in. You got in, you started at the bottom, you fought like hell to get mm-hmm. to a position of stat, like just to get on the road. You know, the, just the difference, mm-hmm. the bounce from being the local. You know, I mean, you look now, when we go on the road, there's such a divide between the local community and the touring crew and you know you can be some tours that everybody's happy and they're nice to the locals and you can be on other tours i mean come on who hasn't seen it where as a crew you come in and you're just shitty because like you said matt they come from the top if the leadership's bad and then everybody's kind of not having the rest or the food or the necessary things they need to feel like humans like every day the towels are darned there or they don't exist i mean how many times does that just like send somebody to another place or you go (laughs) to get a radio battery or you go to get the radio battery and nobody some because they hired some i don't know (laughs) Who, let's be nice. Some young person in production who doesn't understand how critical it is to have big batteries. 
Banks. Oh, oh. You know. Banks will bring his own towels. He brings his okay, own okay, towels. Okay, okay. Okay, so 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 let's get back on point. So then the answer is it's leadership, it's communication, it's it's what? It's mentorship in terms of teaching people young people. People don't want to be mentored anymore. Up. People want to oh. come in and get the money. Nobody yeah. wants to learn. I, before I ever got paid a dime in this. Hey, industry, Debbie Downer. Why I'm don't we figure out the, the positive fucking spin <laughs> here? Like, real, like Sam is asking it. Sam, ask the question again. Ask the question again, please. The question was, uh, uh, <laughs> the emphasis is falling into two big buckets, creating better systems for group care and the need to develop talent. How do you balance that so you don't wind up having people leaving because they feel like okay, they're getting taken go. advantage of? So more, the answer more, isn't more. treat here's them the like a bitch. The answer, answer is give them a fucking helping soft. hand. Come in there like a grown ass man or a grown ass woman and do your shit. Quit being no quit being a baby. Quit wanting to have your hand held. Quit being the last and want to be treated like you're the first. Bust your ass and do the work. And then Kyle, get the respect, huh? Would you say though that there are like situations on the road where people are like abused just by the schedule and stuff and that stuff needs to change? Or well, is again, it all just a matter of making sure your shit's dialed okay. and you Here's have to be thing. good? If that's the schedule, so say hypothetically, we all go out here, we make great money a week per se. Well, our weekly salary, it could be what a person may make a month or even in two months, depending on where you are. So if you bust your ass for a month straight or even two months straight, you've worked, you've made the money of a person who works for the entire year in two months. Gotcha. So I don't want to hear that shit about... Man, I'm busting my ass. Yes, look at your check. Look at your account. Now, if you but if you leave all that money on the road, i.e., drinking and doing whatever the fuck you want to do, buying all the newest bags and not bringing that money home. Prime example. I haven't worked until the other day since February 22nd. Doing little random shit. My overhead is real. I'm not stressing. Why? Because I don't fuck my money up on the road. We, again, we make great money on the road. And if, if if you busting your ass hard for two weeks or for a month or even two months straight, that carries you through the rest of the year, then I, I, I can't feel sorry for you because you've, you've earned that. My son goes to one of the best schools. Why? Because I worked my ass off during those times and I could still pay his tuition and everything else. So I miss me with that. You know, you got to baby people. We out here making goo gobs of money when the money's flowing and if you had to work hard for two months three months to chill for 24 months i can't feel sorry for that and i can't feel sorry for that i don't disagree with you kyle i think you're totally 100 percent correct but i do think we as an industry you know we start, you know, we have a philosophy of work hard, play hard, et cetera. And I think what's recognized now is that the people like the Grattons and, you know, the Schneiders and the Digbys and all these men who have been in the field longer than we have recognize that just by being out there and working your ass off, no matter how good you are, no matter how many, you know, barricades and whatever the metaphors we kind of come up with mm -hmm. that you break through, at the end of the day, if you don't value, like you're, like we're all saying, your family, you know, and put your work ethic in a certain area. And I think, but I think what we're challenged with nowadays is that the people that are coming up underneath us have a very different mindset coming in. And that's what Kyle's talking about right now. And I know, you know, we all have different positions that we have to fill. And if you're lucky enough to be able to staff your own crew, et cetera. I mean, the challenges, you know, that I know I face, it's extraordinary. And like, you know, it's a great question, Sam, you know, I'll, I'll put in all this time and effort into training somebody to do something and then at the end of it, you know, it's just too hard for them to come back and do it again for another. They don't have that value of like, I want to come back and I want to be better. And then we can do this in many other ways, you know, whatever other great thoughts that people who want to survive and are conquerors feel. And I think that, but I also think as a business, we need to be smarter about taking care of each other. You know, again, as these older fellows are saying, because it isn't just work your ass off um, and, and we have to have some sort of legacy, but it's hard for me to understand when I look at some of the younger folks that come in, particularly in some of the areas that I work in, I don't understand why they're coming in. They're just coming in for the glory and the Instagram, Snapchat mm -hmm. moment of it all, exactly. you know, and that's they the don't thing that it, makes, you don't, they don't want to be, they don't want it passed down. You try to pass it right. down. They want to be friends with the artist. Right. You know, Damn it, the artist. I don't give a fuck about the artist. Mm -hmm. Let's, let's go. Let's If I see you in passing, Hey, how you doing? Blah, blah, blah. Keep it moving. I'm not trying to be your friend. 
Because yeah. at the end of the day, when the artists fire everybody, oh man, I thought we were cool. That's what you get for thought, and you're not supposed to thought. Every time you thought, you're wrong. <laughs> well, all right, all right, all right. I, I, I think on that note, it's probably time to move on. But I, I do want to say that at the end of the day, it is on us, those of us that are in leadership positions, those of us that have experience, to bring these young people along and train them in the right way to do things. And if we don't, if they come along with an attitude, if that doesn't change, that too is on us. That is our f- failure. That is our fault. We need to be a part of that change or it's not going to come. And if we allow these young people to just come along with a bad attitude and get away with it, then yeah, they get fired. But if that affects us, if that leads to just other shitty tours and bad situations that we don't make an effort to change, then it's our fucking fault. See, what, what happens is you had a drive. Matt, I fuck with you all the time, but you had a drive. You, 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 you said what I want to do, and this you put your mind to it, and you did all you did your due diligence to make yourself who you are today. You had that grind. Somebody did pass you the baton, but you had to take it. Now, if you sure. if I go to pass it to you and you don't take it, what are there to me? What's there for us to do? It's not our fault. It's your fault for not wanting to receive it. So we have to find the right people who want to take the baton. And that's the hard part, finding the right ones who are willing to reach their hand out and grab it as I'm reaching out to give it to you. So that 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 handoff is, is where the problem is. It's not people aren't trying to give them that handoff. They don't want to receive it. Hell, most people now can't even have a conversation. They text you before they pick up a phone. Fuck a text. A phone call can change the timber of a whole conversation than what a text conversation does. Because a lot should get lost in translation. Just pick up the phone. People, You see people now on dates sitting at a table texting each other. Damn, baby, you look good. I see you. <laughs> Grab her punk-ass hand. Kiss the girl. <laughs> Kiss him. Hold him. Whatever the fuck you going to do. People now, wait don't know a second. how to You said you've seen that happen. Have you actually I've seen, seen that, that happen? happen before? I'm looking at like, yo, are they really texting <laughs> each other, looking at each other? Like, God damn. What is going on with the world today? It's crazy. But that's 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 society. That's everything that's changed. I mean, like you're you're expecting kids to have some type of work value when they don't even go outside and play amongst people and socialize. You're sitting at home playing yes. video games. You're on kids social don't media. play anymore. Exactly. They, like we we had to go out and figure out games. We had to get creative. We had to learn how to work out situations amongst ourselves outside when there was a disagreement or when you had to make up your own on. game. You had to make up Wearing your own your game. Overalls. Yeah. Yeah, all all that. You know, you had values. Like, you had to wash dishes. You had to do chores. You had to do all these different things that made you a person who understood how to work things out and work value. Now, wait a second. Kids, On kids, that kids. note, I got to know. Chris, were you in overalls? What's that? As a kid? Were you in overalls? Yeah, it was popular when I when I when Really? At, at a Kyle, point, were you yeah. in overalls? I never wore overalls, but it was popular. You have one 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 arm, one side clip, other side yeah. down. Running around. Dallas, come on, Dallas, Dallas, did you wear overalls? <laughs> yeah. Oh, Sam yeah. said everybody wore overalls. Did you wear Sam's overalls? Sam's not wrong. Sam's not wrong. I've worn. No, I've I, didn't, okay. I, I didn't. I didn't rock them. Kyle, that's why you you and me are like twins because I never owned a pair of overalls. No, I never. take that back. See, I owned a pair one time. I remember owning a pair one time. I have never worn overalls. But but they were purchased for you. You didn't buy them. I don't even know why I had them. <laughs> Your mom probably got them for you. Thought you were going to paint the house or some shit and you never put them on. <laughs> that definitely never happened. <laughs> Sam, let's move on. <laughs> Kyle, you were talking about passing the baton. So I guess the next question that makes sense here is, what do you guys want to leave behind as the legacy for the people that follow you in the industry? Quit being soft. <laughs> <laughs> for real, though. I mean, that is that is kind of the conversation we just had. Yeah. You 100% I mean, the answer, right? I mean, you my, have to... You... My answer... My answer was was teach the next generation. Kyle's answer was quit being soft, which isn't necessarily. I mean, there's definitely you know an intersection of those two factors that overlap, and 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 I think both of us are right in that. Um, Dallas, what do you think? I'm gonna teach him how to swim. <laughs> <laughs> Venetian Aquatic That's Club. That's my job. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think the Venetian Aquatic Club is that place we went to in Zurich on the river. No, it is a 61-year-old swimming club that I have volunteered for for the last 35 years. 
and she I happen to be the president she elect. She owns that shit. That's hers. It was, <laughs> no, given, it was in her family. Yeah, it's so important. We are like one of the main water safety providers in South Florida. Are you kidding me? It's a big deal. American Red Cross, you know, represent. So yeah, we have to. Yeah, let's hope nobody hears this. <laughs> so Dallas's answer is teach people to swim. Got it. Okay. Absolutely. Thanks. Water safety first. Chris is bartending. <laughs> a cold beverage. Man, you need a refill. Yeah, it's getting low. I mean, we've we've been going for a minute. <laughs> uh, no, never mind. No. <laughs> oh, bartender. Yeah, garçon. Garçon, good evening. Uh, uh-huh. I think I think it's it's important to basically share with others your experience. I think a lot of people learn by experience, and you teach them about how you started off and you started at the bottom. I think it's important that we teach people how to be good people, <laughs> for one, just good people, and learn how to teach people how that this is not going to last forever, that you have to set something up for the future. Boom. And you always have to prepare as if this may be the end. You know, some people think that this is always going to last. You jump on one tour, jump to another. Oh, just keep going, keep going, keep going. You just never know. Something can happen. Corona. Mm-hmm. With that said, I've got four questions, one for each of you. Uh, we're going to start with Matt. So, uh, uh, Matt, as we've seen in pretty much every episode, uh, Kyle likes to paint you as the villain. And uh, I think that that's a role that's kind of forced on you um, by your role as tour director, as you're uh, the liaison between crew and management. So how do you fulfill that obligation uh, of that role, but you still maintain positive relationships? Excuse me while I go get a tissue and and wipe my eyes for being painted as the villain. Good grief. Kyle, am I the villain? (laughs) He's not the villain. He's a financial advisor who shaves people's checks. (laughs) Oh, shaves people's checks. Wow. You're just giving me credit for being a good negotiator. Is that what that is? Uh, You know, how you want to embrace it. (laughs) Look, my, my job is very much to be that liaison. It is true. My job is to fulfill management's wishes, to execute (laughs) the creative design, to assemble the team, to put the right people in place, to create those opportunities, you know, for for that thriving touring industry that we aspire to, to have. Now, sometimes that puts me in a position where I'm fortunate and I have you know, LDs and and video guys who will thank me for kind of being that guy in the video in the middle who can who can deal with management and deal with them and and doesn't put them in the awkward situation that they sometimes find themselves in 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 translating circumstances in a way that one side may or may not understand. I, I have the 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 good fortune of having perspective of being in a management role in the role of a promoter, in the role of an agent, as well as in the role of a touring person. So so I think it's very much to my benefit, and I like to think to the benefit of the tours I put together, that um, that everyone understand each other, that the communication we talked about before be on point, that everybody is given an opportunity to succeed and do their job. And yes, sometimes that makes me the bad guy because... I'm the one who has to talk to somebody about their pay. And I'm the one who has to fire people if shit goes goes south. If if we have an incident on tour, I'm the one who has to I'm HR. I'm the one who has to who who has to have that talking with them. I'm the one who has to say this isn't working out for us or this isn't working out for you or how can I help you succeed? And, um, you know, it has its positives. It has its negatives. I wouldn't change it for the world other than to strive each day to make it better. I like it. All right, Dad, moving to Dallas. Dallas, on a bunch of different episodes and, and in our offline conversations, you've talked a lot about how being a woman in a male-dominated industry has been a tough road. Uh, how far have we come? What else needs to happen? And what actions have you taken to help push that forward for people following behind you? Hmm. Um, have I though? First is the question. Um, 
Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, I've been in the industry 26 years. And when I started, um, I started on a TV show, but in a very short amount of time, I started working um, for a lighting company. And, you know, it was at that time I wanted to tour, you know, I wanted to learn and then be on tour. And there was no way in hell they were going to put a female on a tour bus. You know, and that's a very real situation that, you know, that option was not available. And, you know, although I continued to work there because that was my passion and that was what I wanted to learn, um, I realized after two years that that was never going to change or not in the immediate future. And that, you know, I had managed to been exposed enough to other parts of the industry. So I was able to, you know, fall in with an independent promoter. And, um, but there again, you know, I took over another man's job and that because I made, I negotiated better deals, I was accused of taking, you know, money. Um, you know, like, okay. And then, you know, and then the things like we've had other guests talk about if you're a different color of skin or you're not the normal thing that people expect when you walk into the building and you give the directions that you choose to give, people look through you or they don't want to listen to you or they don't think you're important enough to actually follow the protocol that you've asked. So, um, you know, is it better now? Sure, it's better. There are a lot of females getting jobs that weren't available before. You know, there's nothing greater than seeing, you know, audio ladies and audio, you know, and lighting women and women in video. And But, you know, they're few and far. And, you know, to me personally, I really believe more in excellence. You know, I think if you're qualified for the job, that's what should drive you to get the job, not because of, you know, what gender you are. So, um, and I enjoy being you know, with all the men, so to speak. But I think that, uh, you know, there are challenges, you know, for some people, it's taking a shower at the end of the night, you know, having a female only shower, which, you know, I understand the thought, but let's say you have 85 guys, 85 people on a tour, and there's only three women, why should I dedicate of the five showers, one shower to only female, it just doesn't make sense, you know, and that's the kind of thing that I think sometimes the pendulum swings too far in the opposite direction, you need to be more practical. Um, but overall, I would say, um, for me, I realized because of my introduction to the business and the time that I have spent in it and my trajectory for me, that's why, you know, it took me 10 years before I could get on a tour bus and I had to get on a tour bus as a caterer, you know, and that was at the time, a little bit insulting, I think, you know, do I have a chip on my shoulder about that? Yeah, in some ways, because, you know, I came in with a production experience, but the desire to tour was far greater than my ego. So I was willing to put the ego aside and get out there. And then, you know, I took every other gig I could to get back to where I wanted to be, you know, because that's what you do. Um, But I don't know, you know, I struggle with the female male thing. I think we all deserve opportunities. But again, if you want to work for the best artists out there, you need to be the best person in your craft. Um, you know, and I think it'll be a while still before we see production managers who are women on really big shows because they don't often have the experience. But we do have incredible production managers out there now who are giving women opportunities on large stadium tours that then will result in their trajectory to be that first woman to take a stadium tour across the world you know that's what i look forward to seeing globally but i think it'll be a few years before we see that you know Hmm. does that answer some of your questions that nails it okay all right we'll move into banks uh banks monitor engineer you've got a direct line to the artist and the band when they're on stage um how do you build a rapport and how important is honest communication and what you're doing and then how do you make the artist feel comfortable night after night after night oh um, <laughs> I think the biggest thing is just listening. Uh, most most guys don't listen. Most guys, you know, listen maybe partially. You know, uh, I pride myself on listening to everything and being able to address everybody's issues. Um, with the artists, uh, I would say specifically like with females, a lot of female artists feel like male modern engineers kind of dismiss them and you know they feel like they know more about what they're asking or what they're describing and i pride myself on like actually listen okay me tell me tell me what your issues are what what, what's actually happening and i listen and then i do my best to basically execute what they've asked um and just paying attention uh (laughs) 
a lot of guys, you know, will do tours that they're not into and, you know, they don't pay attention to the band. They don't pay attention to the artists. You know, my thing is like, Hey, I'm looking at you. If something happens, I, I see it right away. If something's going on with the band, they're raising their hand, something's happening. I'm paying attention. I see exactly what's going on. Um, with the band, you know, it's, you become like a, a, a member of that band and it's basically like getting to know each, every, each and every band member, you know, finding out their personalities, you know, what, what makes them tick, you know, especially when you're on these long tours, you know, you have to basically be that person who kind of mitigates issues that happen within the band, you know, and all kinds of stuff. I mean, you become a member of that collective and I think it's just my personality. I mean, I, I, I've, I've pride myself on, being a person who can communicate, who can talk, who can understand, who can listen, who can pay attention. And that's what makes the artists and the band feel comfortable. I'm paying attention, I'm listening, and I'm executing what you've asked. Solid. And now we're going to close on Mr. Hamilton. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I want to tell a quick story, and this is kind of funny, actually. Now, I was talking to another monitor engineer, actually, just a couple of weeks ago. And he was describing his job this way. And, and, and Chris, I think you'll appreciate this. He said he, he's got a particular client who everybody knows, no matter how perfect her audio might be, she's always going to complain. So if you start her audio at exactly the level that you know that she's going to be happy, you are guaranteed to put yourself and your client into a bad situation because every time you make a change, it is going to make it worse instead of better. So what he did every day would he, was he would know exactly where she wanted the levels to be. So right before she walked into the room, he would change everything. And so he would give her the opportunity to complain and incrementally change it to get it back to the point that he knew going into it was perfect. And over the course of the first half an hour or however long of every rehearsal, he would simply work it back to the position that it was in the beginning in order to make her happy. And that is the job of the monitor engineer. Yeah. You're not only a, an engineer, you're a psychologist as well. And a psychiatrist <laughs> in some aspects without prescribing meds, unless you're talking about liquor. Um, you know, but it is, you're, you're, yeah, exactly. You're, you're, you're understanding (laughs) what those things are that makes them, you know, feel like, okay, yeah, you hear what I'm saying. It could be, it's like, oh yeah. Oh, I hear that. I don't hear shit. I don't know what you're hearing, but I don't hear it, but I hear exactly what you're saying. I'm going to go over. I'm going to look busy. I'm going to do my thing. And it's like, perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Exactly. (laughs) We talked about that at dinner. (laughs) Did we? Yeah, we did. We did. We totally talked about it. Okay. <laughs> you were the one who told me this story? No, 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 no. It was, uh, it was CJ. Oh, because he, he was with me when we heard it from this other yeah, monitor yeah, engineer yeah, yeah, yeah. that yeah. we'd oh, been we, in the studio with. Yes. Exactly. That's We've what it was. It. Yep. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Sam. That's Apologies. fine. Didn't mean to interrupt. <laughs> You're good. You're good. Our brother Hamilton. <laughs> Good evening. You both had formal studies in sound engineering and you apprenticed. So what do you see as the biggest opportunities in the industry today to build a pipeline for developing tomorrow's talent? And if you were going to build that pipeline, who are like the, the five people that you'd want helping teach that next generation? Cool. Jesus. The five people. <laughs> yes. Like, hmm. Let me see. Hmm. Hmm. Well, that's an interesting question for the simple fact of, you know, going to school definitely gives you theory. And a lot of times on the road, you don't have, nobody has time to teach you any theory. Why it does, why things do what they do. So the best way to get theory if you didn't go to school honestly would be a church environment because it's more forgiving and you have time to learn to mess up and then the pastor just say bless his heart hallelujah (laughs) and we're gonna figure him out you know he's learning he's doing the lord's work you know so 
you get a chance to you know get on console. But here's the thing: you still would need to read some books to understand the verbiage. Verbiage is is, is a very important key because you know there's different ways to say the same thing, you know, and if you don't have the verbiage, you'll be a lot of things get lost in translation. So hands on is always excellent, but you need to know how to communicate too. Um, with regards to five people, um, I could honestly say I don't have five people that I would just point blank say because even for me, I'm not even one who is would be one to just teach somebody per se. Because my, for me, people say I have no patience. <laughs> I have no patience when people are doing dumb things. And at a certain level, it's like if you're coming to a master's program or a doctorate program, we shouldn't be talking about undergrad shit. And it's just assumed that you know X, Y, and Z. Me, for me, I think I could only mess with somebody who's in the in the doctorate program because, you know, I look at how hard I went for myself. And just to go from here to jump to there, I feel like you're skipping a lot of steps in between. And if you don't put in the work, you know, I worked for forever. I worked for a strong four years without ever getting a dime. So not to say that somebody else has it because everybody's lifestyle is different. So it's hard for me to just say, well, you know, you know, you don't need to be mentor. I was definitely a mentor. My mentor actually died the other day. We don't even know what happened to him. AJ, I'm sure you know him, Chris. And um, it's crazy because he was on top of the world. He mixed everybody. He did a little bit of everything. And then something happened. And it's like, almost like a fall from grace per se. Like he went from doing everything to like, yo, what happened? I don't even know what happened. We still know how he passed, but he gave me the keys to the car, but no, he put the keys to the car on the key hole on the key ring. And I had to grab them. They were there, but you had to go get it. A lot of people don't want to go get it. That's what, that's where that disconnect happens right now. That's what I feel with the problem is nobody wants to, everybody wants the money. And, and the title without putting in the work. So they want a car with 5,000 horsepower, but can't drive it. But that's what you want. <laughs> and it's crazy. You you wanted, I want, a, I want an SD7. <laughs> Put some sound through it. Well, how, how do you do that? What? Why are you even talking about this? Let's start on analog first. Let's get the foundation on the analog console first. Um, session files has, in my opinion, killed the audio industry because everybody just wants a file and don't know what the hell they're doing. You plug in a file, somebody's file, load it up. I'm ready to go. You don't know what the hell that file is doing. You don't. You don't understand the basic. Like perfect example. I was. I'm. I'm studying to get my pilot's license. So. My instructor said, why would you want to learn in this Cirrus SR22 Turbo with the glass glass technology of everything rather than learning on this Cessna or this Piper? Well, it has this, this, this. Well, you don't know the basics. You need to be analog. You need to be doing, get your flaps up. You need to be rolling shit, doing the shit the hard way so that when you get to the digital and the digital world where it's just, t- and it's damn near doing it for you, you can have a complete understanding of the basics. Before you go full technology, nobody wants tech. Nobody wants the basics. They just want to get in and go now. Like Instagram, we want it now, 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 now. Like today's artists, now, 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 now. There's no more artist development. That's why the artists suck, and they only work and they only last for. It used to be 15 minutes of fame. Now we're at 15 seconds of fame. It's a big. It's a big. A lot of time between the 15 minutes and 15 seconds. So it's like everybody wants it now. Let's get some st- sustainability. Let's learn shit. Quit memorizing stuff. Let's actually learn it and make that so that you can troubleshoot. And for like I said, for me, I'm not part of that five. I'm after the fact. 
once we once you have your foundation in, we can I can home you in. Even even interacting with an artist, sitting in the studio watching how artists move, how they li- how they pay attention, how they you could disturb a groove with an artist easily. So just by saying something, shut the fuck up and listen, <laughs> learn, just pay attention, be a fly on the wall. And so it's like it is it's it's a whole lot that goes into that. And I know I'm not one of the five, so I can't even say who what five I would recommend. But um it it, it goes with the individual and how, how bad they want it. You know, how how self motivated are you? When you want to be a basketball player, nobody has to tell you to go out and play basketball in the morning, go shoot layups, go shoot your free throws. You get up and do it. So now as an engineer, yo, did you study your signal flow? Oh man. You have to draw. I had to draw out a signal chart, signal flow, amps, everything from start to finish by memory. Cats not doing that these days. They just want to hit a button and press load. So until I went off on a tangent and forgot what the hell you asked me. But nonetheless, (laughs) I mean, basically what I'm taking away from what you're saying is, is that the Kyle Hamilton pipeline of music education or or sound engineer education is you got to have a playground that you can fuck up in, which is kind of where you, where the Luya comes in. You need to have uh, an educational foundation so that you understand like the actual physics and mechanics of what's going on and you're using the appropriate verbiage. And then uh, you also need to just like work on your craft. So you're not, fucking up when it comes to playing just, like work on your craft yeah i mean stay ready so you don't have to get ready long story short if you want it bad enough somebody will be able to teach you but you have to want it first i can't force it down you have to be receptive to be ready to learn because there's a lot coming at you in a short amount of time so that's that's just really the long and short of it got it all right motherfuckers there it is so Tech support, we appreciate you asking the questions today. I actually think this turned into a fairly uh, informative and interesting episode. Kyle Hamilton, motherfucker. Good evening. I appreciate your insights. It was a very tasteful and uh, roundabout way of not answering the question. (laughs) Kudos for that. Ryan Maurer taught me that. (laughs) (laughs) That was good. <laughs> Shot across the bow <laughs> as we sit here waiting on our mic delivery. It's going out. <laughs> oh, man. That is fucking funny as shit. Funny. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. No no throwing anybody other, uh, under the bus. See, we do that to each other. That's not to Bruce people Lee, that aren't the art here. Of fighting to- without fighting. You know. Yeah, well, we don't do that to people that aren't here to defend <laughs> themselves. We just keep it to each other. It's so, love. <laughs> your free shit just went out the window. <laughs> I don't like free. I like to buy. Then, I, then you can't hold me to it. <sighs> there you have it. Well, another one in the can. We appreciate all of our hosts. We appreciate our tech support. Everybody, give it up to Sam. For his Sam in the building. Questions. So. Before we go, round of parting shots. First, from the Venetian Aquatic Club, Christine <laughs> Dallas, what do you got? Go vote. Be registered. Let's get this done. Brother Banks. Christine's right. Please vote. <laughs> Please. Need a ride? Call me. <laughs> you need help? Need a stamp? I'll, I'll I'll pay for your stamps. Whatever. I got you. Let's vote. Motherfucker, what do you say? Lakers. <laughs> Not Raiders. Lakers. Because we got to finish the basketball season. The first Raiders are one, one game so far. It got long season ahead. Lakers about to win the championship again. So it's Laker time. Tech support, what about you? Uh, I just want to warn everybody that's watching professional football that the Patriots now have uh, probably the best quarterback in the league in the smartest system in the league. So shit's about to get real. I mean, not real. It's going to be the same thing as it always is. We're just going to have a running quarterback. Wow. Get ready. Raiders. Can I mute him?
Oh, actually, I'm going to fix him in the mix. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, can't take it away from him. He's not wrong. Title Town USA, still in the house, still in the building. We yeah. want to go do go toe-to-toe. What do we got? Six Pats Super Bowls in the last, what, 20 yeah, years? You got, you Wasn't have, it the Raiders uh, who also started that in the snow game? Uh, when you guys, uh, the tuck, the tuck games, the tuck, you know, tuck rule, the there tuck it rule, is. tuck rule. When you mess this up in '92, yeah. yo, I don't write the NFL rules. I'm just saying that it was the Raiders who were the last obstacle to start in the dynasty, and then they got, yeah. they got yeah, taken you got down. You, yeah, you wore us out. You know, you had a tuck. He was, he was in the gr- no, it was in the grasp. That's what it was in the grasp. Tuck rule, some silly shit. And yeah, we were we were <laughs> damaged since then. Now we're on our way back. It's all good. Well, good luck with that to all our listeners out there. I actually, again, I'm kind of happy with today from the true hustlers. I still think Kyle should have answered the question. I'm kind of offended. He didn't name brother banks, Christine Dallas and myself. Wow. Motherfucker. I didn't even, admi- saying, I didn't even acknowledge myself. <laughs> so actually shit. you specifically said you're the next level guy that they turn to after those five. That's actually what you again, did. It was a again, roundabout way of patting yourself on the back. <laughs> I am the doctorate instructor, where I think his exact words. <laughs> doctorate instructor. Yeah, it's a... oh, All right, motherfuckers. Well, on that note, as Dallas said, as Banks said, we are six weeks out from an election. Please, God, don't forget to vote. Make sure you are registered. Know where your polling location is. Wear your fucking mask. Wash your fucking hands. Get out the fucking house and do something good for this country. And that's all I got to say on that. So thank you all and good night.